too much work, so <laughs> don't worry about it. But that may be something to do instead of the chat. All right, good deal. So uh, she's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and do our introduction. Um, so today we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Jean Anderson Eloy. He is vice chair and distinguished professor of olaryngology, head and neck surgery, as well as distinguished professor of neurological surgery and distinguished professor. Oh, he's got a lot of distinguished professors of ophthalmology and visual sciences. He's the director of rhinology and sinus surgery, director of olaryngology research, co-director of endoscopic skull-based surgery program, chair and chief of service of Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. Um, and it's, you know, he's also the vice chair of the olaryngology department at Rutgers New Jersey School of Medicine. Uh, and, and basically that says he's like pretty awesome. And I think it's so important to have someone like Dr. Aloy give a talk um, because it really shows, as Dr. Francis was saying, the breadth and diversity of Harry Barnes members and, and what we're doing in, in the specialty. One of the biggest uh, uh, challenges we face, and you see it again and again, is that people say they don't get the mentoring they need. They don't have the role models that they need. And five years, 10 years down the road, they realized that maybe there were opportunities for success that they missed because they didn't have the right connections. And so one of the things that the Harry Barnes Society does, the grand rounds, the NMA meetings, et cetera, is to try to bring us together so we can fellowship with each other and, and see you know, and celebrate our greatness and our achievements. I'm not gonna go through all of his uh, achievements. There are just far too many to mention, but you know, well uh, published. Um, and just overall, just uh, one of the more distinguished figures in our, our specialty. Tonight, he's going to talk a little bit about sinus surgery and how he does it. Uh, and I'm, so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. I'm going to go on mute and, and just participate when you need me to. Thanks again. I'm Dr. Johnson. So um, as I uh, mentioned before, if, uh, we don't have many people, so let's keep it quite interactive. If you guys have any questions, do not hesitate to stop me so that uh, we can go over it. Um, I'll try to stay on time. Um, I try to prepare this talk and make it uh, as comprehensive as possible um, on both um, basic sinus surgery and extended sinus procedures. Then I realized that uh, there's way too much that I wanted to say. So this first part would be mainly on basic sinus surgery um, and how I do it, um, some of the philosophies that I've picked up along the way. I don't have any conflict of interest to any of the material that I'm presenting. Um, so um, I think I'm pretty clear to speak freely about, about any, any of it. So um, in general, if you're looking at sinus surgery in, uh, in this country, there's some absolute indication why we do them, and then there's some um, relative indication. Some of the absolute indications are people who have sinusitis that's causing a brain abscess, meningitis, a subperiosal abs orbital abscess, carrying a sinus thrombosis, other type of infections such as pus, uh, puffy tumor, um, facial cellulitis. Uh, in those cases, you have a complication from the sinusitis. You have to go ahead and uh, treat the underlying condition. So you will do sinus surgeries for the patient with a sinus mucosal or mucoparacil. Um, fungal sinusitis, massive polyposis, blocking the patient's nasal cavities. Uh, and in some cases uh, of neoplasm or suspected neoplasm, you have to go ahead and, and do the surgeries. Uh, so this is an, an example for the um, um, students that are in here of a subperiosal um, epidural abscess here. And this is a superior abscess in the superior aspect of the orbit. So this is because of the sinusitis. Just joining this is not enough. You want to make sure you address the reason of, of, of the abscess. Um, and if you don't do that, uh, they're gonna, this is going to recur. Um, a patient with a pot puffy tumor where you have the essence of the um, anterior all of the frontal sinus, um, this is not a case that you should go ahead and treat with antibiotics alone. You should probably go ahead and treat the underlying condition, uh, which is the sinusitis as well. Patient with mucosil, typically mucosil do not get 
better um, with just um, medical management. So you would have to do sinus surgery to treat that. Allergic fungal rhinosinusitis can be improved with medical management, but you usually would go ahead and combine that with uh, sinus surgery. So those are the um, really absolute indication and then the relative indications, which is the reason why we do most of our sinus surgeries in this country is uh, uh, for patients with recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, where they keep on getting recurrent sinus infection um, and then chronic rhinosinusitis that has failed to clear on appropriate medical therapy. In those cases, you would need to do sinus surgery. There are some newer indication where you would do sinus surgery in combination with other things. Um, patients with CSF leaks with anterior skull base uh, defect and encephalocele, uh, some anterior skull base lesion, um, middle skull base and paracellular lesion, and infratemporal fascia lesions. So some would call those, you know, extended sinus surgery and what we call base surgery. But for our purpose, uh, we'll call it going to the nose endoscopically as a pathway. Uh, you have to do sinus surgery to get there. So we'll, we'll, we'll bunch them into this category. One of the key things that I try to teach my resident is that patient selection is key as you're doing those surgeries in order to have great success. Uh, do not operate on patient that are asymptomatic. If a patient is not symptomatic, you have to really question why you would need to touch them. Uh, you have to make sure those patients have failed medical management unless they are part of those patients who we need, they absolutely need the surgery, as I mentioned before. Uh, you should have post-treatment radiographic evidence of sinus disease. If the sinus um, is clear and they get better, don't just go ahead and do surgery on a, on a clear sinus. And patients should also have understanding of uh, endoscopic sinus surgery and the limitations of sinus surgery. Very important because if you operate on patients and they don't understand that the surgery is necessary, in, in many cases, is not just the final answer, it may just be something you do to open the nasal cavity to provide um, topical medications. Um, they may be uh, upset at you that uh, thinking that this was going to be the, the end all and they don't want to do anything after the surgery in terms of medical treatment and they're going to need other surgeries. So be, be clear in uh, what you're telling them. Um, in uh, 1992, um, uh, Kennedy mentioned that uh, when you're looking at prognostic factors, outcome and staging, he did more sinus surgery, and I, I would probably extend that to most other sinuses. The extent of the disease on the CAT scan is the only factor significantly predictive of surgical prognosis. Um, I would not say this is the only factor in my practice, but this is one of the main factors. So patients with no disease on, uh, uh, on a CAT scan, they tend not to be happy after sinus surgery. And patients who have a lot of disease burden tend to do much better when you do surgeries. No. For the residents, um, if we're going to go into sinus surgery, we need to also to make sure we don't get into complications, that you don't get sued um, based on what you do. This is a paper that I put out in 2014, looking at uh, pearls that can keep us from getting into complications. As you know, we're preventing complications in, in any surgeries is more important than, um, than dealing with the complication afterward. So that dealing with all of the booby traps that we might, we might face and try to say, how can you prevent those things? Um, one um, measure that we use before doing sinus surgery is the Lone and Mackay CT staging system. Um, I think this is the most commonly used CT staging system that give you an indication as to whether you're operating on a patient that has significant disease or a patient that really have no disease. If the lone in Mackay is very, very low, um, try to think about treating this patient with continuous medical therapy um, because that may not be a patient who's going to really benefit from sinus surgery. So keep that in mind. There's many others out there. There's uh, one of them from the University of Miami where I did my fellowship that uh, that's way more complicated. But I think this is simple enough um, to, to do those calculations with the lone in Mackay. Okay. So more preparation. Um, so when I'm doing surgeries on sinus patients, I tend to give them a sheet with all the um, big complications and the most common complications, okay? So you wanna include all of the potential severe complications. 
one of those things that I've seen is that a lot of people don't talk about anosmia because a lot of patients, um, they do come with anosmia. If you don't document it later on, they cannot smell, uh, could be a, a problem. Um, so make sure you put all of those things um, into it. Anything that's common, put into that free operative sheet. Now, I give that to the patients to go home with for about one week, and I bring them back after they've read it so that I can answer their questions. This is uh, uh, talking about anosmia. Now, this is a paper um, that uh, we wrote uh, in 2014, looking at olfaction and people being sued because of patients complaining of olfaction. Um, so just make sure you don't fall into this. Um, make sure you discuss that and why that before you do sinus surgery, because again, a lot of patients with significant sinus disease are anosmic. And if you don't document it later on, they can actually sue because they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, smell. Uh, another thing, again, that we need to be very careful about, we all know about CSF, like if you're going to do sinus surgery. Another man is looking at the United States uh, um, patients that have actually complained and have sued um, for problem with um, CSF like during sinus surgery. Um, if you're looking at the amount of money they, they make, um, the... Um, uh, when you're looking at the, 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 when you lose that case, it's about one, one million on average that you would, you would have, to have to pay. So it's pretty significant. And then the eye is the other um, big thing. Um, if you go and somebody has an orbital injury, if you look at the average um, for the payment, it's about 1.13 million. So there's a lot that are much higher than that. Okay, you 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 gotta be very cautious. Uh, make sure you discuss those things. Make sure it's in your informed consent. Okay. Um, part of the preparation also, history of bleeding, CBC, chemistry, PTPTT. Some of those tests, uh, you have to decide whether or not another patient really needs it based on their medical uh, comorbidities. If a patient has any medical condition uh, that I'm concerned about, I'm going to make sure we get um, medical clearance. Um, and then um, always try to ask about poor adverse anesthesia re uh, reaction. All the this is typically the job of the anesthesiologist. Those are your patients. It's simple to ask those in a form. So make sure you ask those patients and add them. Uh, because I'm in a teach teaching institution, I review the usually review the case. Uh, the day before the OR with my um, uh, fellow and resident uh, with the full history, the indication, set a plan for intraoperative maneuver that make the case flow so much quicker, plan for positive medications and adequate content with proper documentation. Yeah. I review the CAT scan. What do you want to look for? The score based anatomy, the medial orbital wall anatomy, the location of the anterior ethmoid artery, the lamina propitia. Any laminar propitia or score based dehiscence, uh, variation in normal anatomy, and access to the nasal cavity. Sometimes the patient has so much uh, polyps in their nose that you can't really go in there and inject. So you need to make sure you pay attention to that. Is the septum so deflected that you also cannot have access to one of the nasal cavities? Those should be able to be known easily to the review of the CAT scan. How much disease is there? How many sinuses are involved? Is this a revision case? Important because um, in my practice, um, I usually take what the case give, uh, give me while I'm operating. If it's a brand new case, I usually would go from a, using a mesoclingo approach from anterior to posterior. If it's a revision case, I tend to look for cells in the posterior ethmoid cavity where it's much wider and then go from posterior to anterior, which is um, somewhat safer. The scope of the score base is important to note on those CAT scan. Uh, does the patient have curious type? Uh, one to three, is it symmetrical? It's been proven that in patients who have different type of score base symmetry in terms of the curious type, um, we tend to actually go and enter uh, the, the, the highest curious type where you have a much longer lamina lateralis. So make sure you pay attention to that. Specifically, if you operate on a side where you have a chaos type one and you've forgotten, you go to the other side, 
and the patient has a cross that three, you can enter the query form. Okay, is there any dehiscence in the, in the score base? Is there any disease abutting the score base? Because sometimes it may be better um, to not take every single uh, cell of the score base. And um, is the uh, anterior etmoid artery intracranial or extracranial? And most importantly, is the anterior etmoid that we have to be careful about when you're doing an anterior etmoid and going in the area of the frontal sinus recess. This is the score base anatomy. Remember, as you're operating, the score base slope inferiorly. So as you're going in, be careful. It might be better to get to the score base here and then go retrograde. In revision case, this is a nice technique to prevent from really going and entering the score base. Uh, the, again, I'm talking about the kerostat, the height of the lamina lateralis here is important. Uh, this is sort of like a kerostat two that we're seeing. A tap one is more shallower and the tap three is much deeper than that. And those are the ones that you tend to get into trouble. Um, the medial orbital wall, we should really review that on the CT anatomy. Again, the hisense, location of the anterior and posterior etmoid artery, location of the lacrimal sac and duct. And very importantly, the relationship of the uncinate process to the medial orbital wall. That can dictate what kind of tool you're going to use to really reset the uncinate when you're doing your maxillary intrastomy. Yeah. Right here, if you could imagine you do a, a, a etmoidectomy on this side and you don't pay attention, you don't have your CT scan with you, and you try to do the same thing here, you're going to get into the orbit. So be careful about this. Okay. The location of the anterior etmoid artery here, if you look at this here, you have that little mesentery there that's always pointing to the uh, anterior etmoid. This is right next to the superior oblique muscle here. So when you see that, know that this is where the anterior etmoid is, is going to. Um, other variation of the more anatomy that you should know, a hollow cell. And another cell is important because sometimes you could have the um, optic nerve and quadrant uh, artery in that posterior etmoid cell. So be careful when you're actually opening the anatomy cells. The agonese cell and what that could do to your frontal sinus opening, um, and then all the type of the frontal cell, type one, two, three, and four um, in configuration that I'll talk to you guys quickly about. This is an, a, a, an example of a hollow cell. Um, the hollow cell, when you're doing sinus surgery, if you don't pay attention to this um, on the CAT scan, it may make it seem like this is the orbit. And if you leave this cell, you may not open the maxillary sinus as wide as you can. So make sure you pay attention to that cell um, when you're doing surgery. And it could be you, it could be one cell or multiple other cell in the same site. So you have to make sure in this configuration, you go and remove all of these cells. And the another cell, remember, as we mentioned before, the optic and the carotid sometimes could be right on the side uh, uh, um, and the wall of that cell. Um, and sometimes within the cell. So be careful with that. Um, the agonese cell is the most anterior etmoid cell, uh, etmoid cell. And depending on the size, could encroach into the frontal sinus outflow pathway. So when you're doing frontal sinus surgery, it's important to know how to address this cell so that you could get a large opening of the frontal sinus. Uh, for the resident, this is a type one frontal cell where you have the, the frontal cell which is um, this cell here, right superior to the agonese cell. This is a type one, one cell. A type two frontal cell where you have the agonese, and then you have two cells, frontal cell above the agonese in the frontal sinus recess. A type three frontal cell is one cell that goes in the frontal sinus proper that's above the agonese cell. And then the type four frontal cell is an isolated a uh, frontal cell. Um, so it's um, good to know those cells. There's a new classification that was published um, recently, the International Frontal Sinus Classification, where they divide those cells in the frontal sinus into anterior cells, posterior cell, and medial cell, with the anterior cells um, pushing the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus medial, posterior, or posterior medially. And then the posterior cells are going to push the frontal sinus pathway anteriorly, 
and then the medial cell, they're gonna push the drainage path patholaterally. This is all good to know those for academic purposes. Um, when I'm doing functional sign surgery, I found out that those are pretty useless to me. So it's good to know them, but during surgery, you're gonna remove those cells. So what's important when you're doing surgeries is to know the wall of the frontal sinus recess, how far are you gonna go, okay? Say to yourself, the medial wall is the middle turbinate, the lateral wall is the laminar propitium, the posterior wall is the anterior face of the bullite modalis, um, and the anterior wall is the agonizing cell. So you go to the, to the borders, so all of this fancy cell in the frontal sinus recess, yes, again, academically, it's good to talk to them, uh, to talk about them, but during surgery, you just need to go to the wall of those cells uh, 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 of the opening and then just take everything that's in between out. Um, so preoperative medication that I use, I tend to use systemic corticosteroid and preoperative antibiotics before I do start the surgery. Decrease reduces inflammation, decrease intraoperative blood loss. Okay, there's a um, there's there is a um, good indication that a relationship that when you can see if the vis visual field if the field is clear during sinus surgery you tend to have less complication and have better outcome. So do what you can um, in those patients to make sure you get good. Um, um, hemostasis and, and you clear the field. And treating patients with polyps with um, steroid and patients that are infected with antibiotics does um, decrease intraoperative bleeding and increase your visualization. Um, intraoperatively, what do you need? You need your CAT scan available for you at all time. You need to be able to see. Again, strong association with your limited visualization and complication. So do what you can to see. And then you need to adequately control bleeding. To do that, you want to make sure you have a good history from the patient about bleeding, list of prescription and non-prescription medication that they take. Um, again, should include herbal medicine because a lot of people are on herbal medicine these days. And then, as I mentioned, preoperative corticosteroid and antibiotics for polyps patient and patient with active infection. I tend to use intraoperatively um, topical decongestion. I, I use um, one to 1,000 of epinephrine um, I used to use oxymetazoline, but I think the 1 to 1,000 epinephrine is better. Cocaine, I don't use because of the um, issues with um, stigma associated with the drugs. And then phenylephrine is not that good. I think this is the worst out of all of those. I think uh, cocaine is probably the best followed by epinephrine, 1 to 1,000, and then oxymetazoline. But I go with um, 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. Um, infiltration with vasoconstrictive agent, 1% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 of epinephrine. Make sure you can differentiate those two on, on your, in your field. Um, don't just inject and quickly go and start operating. That doesn't work. If you're gonna do, if you're gonna inject, give it some time, five to minutes or so, five to 10 minutes for, 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 for this to take effect. And communicate with your anesthesiologist before and throughout the case. Tell them what you're doing. Um, tell them where you want the, the um, blood pressure to be. If it's someone that you work um, repeatedly with, they're going to know. But most in most places, you work with a different um, group of anesthesiologists. Communicate with them. Tell them what you would like, and, and they'll do it for you. And then TIVA, if they have it, I would ask them to use it. Um, although know that TIVA is, is way more and, and, and more expensive than inhaling agents. Where do you infiltrate if I'm infiltrating? The uncinate process, the anterior superior attachment of the middle turbinate, the tail of the middle turbinate, um, near the area of the spinopalatine for women. This is gonna be very, very important. That's the, the, the um, largest blood supply to the nasal cavity. So if you do a good injection here, you're pretty good. Uh, nasal septum. And if I cannot see into the nasal cavity, I'll go to a greater palatine canal infiltration to make sure I can, I can inject. Okay, so I again pack the nose with uh, either oxymetazoline or one to one thousand typical epinephrine um, so cotinoid. That's what I would use. Infiltrate the nasal mucosa um, um, with one to two hundred thousand of epinephrine uh, solution, and I tend to tell them to try to keep the system, systemic blood pressure um, about uh, one hundred unless there's contraindication um, based on the patient's 
um, medical um, history. If you're gonna have the, use the one to 1000 epinephrine um, solution again, put some fluorescein in there um, or any kind of other dye to, to make sure you can differentiate it from something you're gonna inject. Another thing that I think is useful for to keeping the clean the uh, field clean, use warm irrigation about um, 40 deg uh, degrees Celsius. This is something that I've taken from my neurosurgery colleagues. This is really, really um, good when you're doing sinus surgery and it's oozing and it's not a specific artery uh, or, or, or a specific place that you have a bleeding. That really clean the field for you and allow you to see really nicely. Again, our neurosurgical colleagues use them all the way during skull based surgery. Um, so this is something that I think could help us during those cases. Um, I mentioned the greater palatal canal injection, um, which um, based on the study that I did when I was a fellow, uh, showed significant decrease uh, um, in um, estimated blood loss. Okay, example, this is where you're gonna wanna inject here. Um, in here, you're gonna inject up here in the area of the unseen mid here. Um, and if you're gonna go into greater palatal canal, you need to have, uh, uh, don't go more than 25 millimeters and bend the, the 25 gauge needle at about 45 degree angle to go into the canal. If you go too far, you could go into the inferior orbital fissure, uh, inferior orbital fissure and create blindness. You don't want that. Um, quick word about balloon sinusotomy. Um, we all know um, that came around um, a little bit more than 10 years ago, uh, almost 15 years now, I believe. Um, I don't tend to use them much in sinus surgery. Uh, I think there's limited use for them. I use them in case I do like a frontal sinus surgery and the frontal sinus is closing. Is, is closing. Um, I would just, in the office, use a balloon. And um, I mean, I think I can count um, in my career having done maybe less than 10 balloon sinus, sinoplasty. So keep that in mind. But there is um, some cases where um, that device can be quite helpful. Um, also, um, this is uh, showing this case where you're looking at this and this is closing up on you. You could use a balloon to kind of salvage um, this, this um, photosinusitum. Other cases uh, that I've done with it, if you have a patient that's really, really sick, who has a very accessible mucous cell such as this, and this patient has a patient with severe COPD, couldn't go to the operating room, you could go ahead in the um, in the office and then just um, make sure you have CT and MRI to make sure this is not an encephalocell, and then suction, prove to yourself that this is a mucous cell. You could use the balloon to kind of repeatedly open this. Other things, steroid eluding implant, I tend to use um, sparingly in my practice. I do believe that there's some place for them, but um, they tend to create a lot of crossing uh, into the ethmoid cavity, specifically if exposed to air in a wide open nasal cavity. So I tend not to put them into the ethmoid cavity. The only place I would put them now is in the frontal sinus, either the um, um, if I do an endoscopic lock up with a lot of polyps in it, I would use that. Um, that has some advantage to it, but in most other places in the uh, app, I found that they're more of a problem than, um, than really helping <clears throat> the patients in terms of the final outcome. Okay. Uh, Post-operatively, when I finish with those patients, I see them on the post-operative day number um, um, seven or eight based on how my schedule worked for the first debridement. And then about a week later, and then I'd see them about two weeks um, and then four weeks and then three months. And then I would do six months thereafter. And the reasoning behind the close follow-up is that there's a high incidence of recurrence in patients lost to follow-up. Um, and, um, and if you catch them early enough, you could treat them with aggressive medical therapy. Um, and if recurrence, you could diagnose it early. One other thing I would mention is the, the use of image guidance. Um, when I went to do my fellowship, we didn't use image guidance. Um, that was about uh, 15 years ago, even though it was um, uh, really using most of the fellowship. I think this was 
um, quite helpful to me. I think there's some um, advantage to using the image guidance. Um, if you look at what the Academy put out, um, it is at the discretion of the operating surgeon. I currently now use them as I'm teaching residents. Um, you could use it for almost every single scenario except for a non-complicated maxillary sinusotomy or an anterior hemodectomy. Um, so pretty much is it at your discretion and I think there's some good use to it. Um, there are people who believe that if you use, if you don't use image guidance, there could be potential liability for you if something was to happen, which was a concern. So I did look into this in um, 2013, published this paper where I looked at what happened in terms of not using image guidance in your surgeries, even though I think, again, there's advantage to it, uh, but I didn't find one single case where somebody was sued for or lost litigation because they didn't use image guidance. So find whether or not this is something that's important in your career, in your, in your, in your um, cases, and if it is, then make sure you use it and use it appropriately. Um, is image guidance um, important in, in cases of litigation? Um, I don't believe so. I haven't seen anything to indicate that. I think it's great if you're looking for small lesions that you want to make sure you don't destroy the surrounding anatomy and that allow you to go directly to the lesion. Or you need adequate calibration. It may add to surgical time, but as you use it more regularly, um, you shouldn't need too much time to set it up. And remember that this um, systems, they, comp they should complement your knowledge of the anatomy and, and not replace um, your knowledge of the anatomy. Typically, if there's a question between image guidance and um, what I believe is the popular anatomy, I typically would trust myself. So I'm gonna show some of the, uh, a few videos here. Again, if anybody has any questions, um, please let me know and I'll stop. In this specific case here, I'm showing a patient who have a, 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 a septoplasty. You encounter that during when you're doing sinus surgery. Um, so you see there was some deviation here um, in that left side. And I'll show how we would go ahead. This is the right nasal endoscopy before, and you'll see the deflection in the left side in a minute here. Um, so you're gonna wanna do sinus surgery in there. How do I do it? So I go step by step in what I, what I do the way I do this here. So you wanna make sure you inject. Okay, you have a cold deflection with nine of the internal nasal valve. You have permanent posterior gony spur. So this is a deflection here. Um, and if you go more superiorly in the area of the internal nasal valve, you see the superior deflection, which is something that a lot of people tend to leave behind because of concern about um, nasal deformity. You see the bony spur, and you see this here, a superior septal deflection. Um, sometimes that can block access to getting into the frontal sinus. So we're gonna make sure we inject here into that spur, inject more in anteriorly. And it then again, I usually would take my time as I'm injecting to make sure I elevate a nice plane. I use a 30 degree scope to do all of these um, endoscopic septoplasties, then go under the spur, come anteriorly to where you see the deflection here. And then I'm going to use the back of the knife to elevate the lower lateral cartilage so that I can make a relaxing incision. Now that relaxing incision superiorly there is where if it's going to bleed superiorly at the apex of that incision, that's where you're going to have the bleeding. Then I would go ahead and use a suction bovie to kind of make sure I dry this up and then take your time, make sure you get into the proper plane, okay? Once you get into the proper plane, you could use a different instrument. You could use the cardio elevator. You could use suction, uh, a small number eight suction as well to do this dissection. And here we're doing it with the cardio. And then this is the area of the decussating fibers. This is where if you're gonna get a perforation that you typically are gonna get that. Um, so be very careful in that area. Um, it is not the end of the world. If you do get a perforation there, just make sure that the same thing doesn't happen in the contralateral side. Um, and then really exposing the area of the deflection here going posteriorly. And then 
take a 15 blade to really cut the cartilage um, partially. You don't need to go too far in just so that you don't cut the contralateral um, mucopericonjugal flap. And then we elevate this and then turn the cardio around. Make sure you're in the proper plane. And if you're not sure you're not in the proper plane, please take your time to make sure you're in a good plane. And then now I'm going to out fracture the inferior portion of the cartilage here. And then I'm going to take a Blixley to really start removing the deflected portion of the cartilage. You could try to remove it at once and crush the cartilage and put it back. I've done that in younger patient, patients. Um, then this inferior portion where you have the um, large um, spur from the vomer, a lot of people like not to touch. You can get some numbness if you do this, but it, they typically do not last significantly. Okay, And I've always felt as by removing that crest inferiorly, um, you don't only just open one nasal cavity, uh, you also open um, the, I'm sorry, the contralateral nasal cavity um, as well. Sorry, what did I do there? Yeah, you open the contralateral nasal cavity as well because um, that spur could be quite large. And by taking that out here um, and you put the flap back, you have a much thinner flap, flap the septum, is much thinner, and that really increase the um, nasal cavity on, bo on both sides here. So we're gonna continue posteriorly. There's uh, one concern that people have always said you shouldn't whack the superior aspect, not to get a CSF leak because you could break the cribriform. Um, they are correct. You'll see that now what I'm doing is I'm using the Blakesley forcep almost as a cutting instrument to weaken the cartilage and cause it to break exactly where I want without transferring to the skull base. And then this is when we're done here. The spurs continue out. You do have a, um, a, a, some tear in that um, side of the cartilage, but you keep your other side com completely preserved. And then when I'm done, I use a um, um, four plane um, suture for plane got to really make sure I suture this in a baseball tap stitch. And uh, some people don't do that. They leave it um, um, without really suturing it. This is the way we did it in my fellowship. Um, but when I was in residency, my attending always sutured it. And I feel as though you get a much better uh, result when you, when you do that. In addition to really quilting um, the um, septum at the end, Another thing that I prefer to do is um, I tend to use doll splints as well. And again, this is the right nasal endoscopy. This is the sinus procedure is done here. And this is the left. Now you see wide open nasal cavity, preserve as much of the turbinate as possible here. And then you would see right and left, wide open. Um, and those patients do very well um, by removing the spur and allowing access. And then, I do use Doyle splint. The Doyle splint I put in, I cover them with bacitracin and I suture them to the um, membranous columella using a tool silk um, suture. Um, one of the reasons why I like to put the Doyle splint is if you do sinus surgery, um, it prevents air from getting into the nose. And in the post period, I feel as though they heal better. I think the dorsal also, if you do submucosal of the resection of the inferior turbinate, pushes uh, the turbinate laterally and makes it heal in a desirable position while also keeping the septum um, in the midline. Some patients don't like them, but uh, I overall prefer it because I think uh, the, the uh, discomfort that they get is worth it. Um, this is a, a revision endoscopic um, sinus surgery here. I'm going to move this uh, further. 34-year-old uh, woman who presented white sided nasal obstruction, had a previous septoplasty. Um, and when you look at the nasal cavity, it was completely blocked here. So in this case, I decided I was going to do bilateral submucosal resection of the inferior turbinate and address the septum. So this is 
And if you're a turbinate, you see the deflection here, the call of deflection. And then um, finish this here. You see how much space you have because of the deflection of the septum into the, the contralateral right side. So we're gonna make a similar incision into inferior to the, to the deflection and going superiorly here. And then just as in the other case, you elevate the lower lateral cartilage, you make that relaxing incision, and then you cauterize. Um, I do that now with a, um, instead of a 12 punch, I do a, um, an eight punch um, suction cautery. I feel as though it's more malleable. It doesn't block your view as much as that 12 used to do it or the 10. And then it's much harder again, in this case, I, you, you would expect this is a revision to remove, uh, to find the proper plane. And then here we see where the previous uh, person removed the um, removed the cartilage. And as, uh, as you could see, um, the cartilage is removed exactly where it shouldn't be removed. The area of the deflection inferiorly and superiorly are not taken care of. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the inferior deflected portion now. Uh, you make that incision and then you're gonna take that into pieces, taking it out. And then move posteriorly, expose that wide spur. As you could see here, look at the size of this thing here. So it's, it's really causing some obstruction and widening the, the uh, um, narrowing the space. So I would take that out with a uh, Blakesley or a Jensen Middleton, a close um, Jensen Middleton. More anteriorly here. So you wanna take your time, dissect that uh, big bony spine. And in the Jensen Middleton, you wanna, you wanna crush it I know a lot of people like to use chisels. I think the Jensen Middleton do as good a job. You quash it and then you rotate. And then now I'm gonna address the superior deflection here, uh, which again, um, this individual is left behind. And you're gonna quash the cartilage so that you cut it exactly where you want it without transferring anything necessarily into the score base here. And I've had no issues with that. And then at the end, if you look at what you can accomplish uh, with this technique uh, endoscopically here, this is the left side here. And then you use a four plane gut again to suture the um, septum. And you see here, this is that area where you couldn't see anything. And now this patient has a widely patent bilateral nasal cavity. Um, use the door splint for about a week, left and right, and then switch right to the membranous columella using a two or self suture. And uh, now the last one is how do I do my typical endoscopic sinus surgery in this next video? Is patient 58 year old woman treated with, um, with um, medical management. This is the CAT scan after treatment here. Um, deviated septum, bilateral, ethmoid, maxillary, and sphenoid disease. Um, this is the corona scan, and this is your actual scan here. And then sagittal. And then you decongest with one to one hundred thousand of epinephrine. Wait five minutes. Infiltrate with one percent lidocaine with one to one hundred thousand of epinephrine using a twenty-five gauge needle. Okay, this is the area where you're gonna and wanna inject. This is the best area to inject. Uh, right at the area of the sphenopalatine posteriorly there, right there. Um, if you can get a good injection there, you would be uh, golden. Okay. And then take your time as you're injecting, um, injecting now in the area of the unseenate process. And then at the root of the 
attachment of the middle turbinate. And then you out factor the uncinate process, out factor the inferior turbinate, gentle mineralization of the middle turbinate, and complete uncinectomy. So I prefer to use a frontal sinus probe to really reflect the uncinate process anteriorly away from the lateral nasal wall. And then I use a curved microdebrider to typically resect the uncinate. Okay. So you see here, I'm using a Goldman bar to lateralize the inferior turbinate. Even though you have a lot of space in this, um, I believe getting a little bit more space never will really hurt you. So I would still lateralize the inferior turbinate with a Goldman. And now I use a curved microdebrider. The reason why I like to use a curved microdebrider to do this as opposed to a straight microdebrider is that if you're using a straight microdebrider to try to do it, the microdebrider is going to really create some trauma in the lateral nasal wall. Um, so I don't want that. Now I'm using this here. Expose the true osteum. And then I'm going to use a straight shoe cut to open the maxillary. So you want to ergonomically open the straight shoe cut inside the maxillary sinus and then just cut from an interior to posterior direction. And then use your curved microdebrider to continue to open this and then take a straight microdebrider to take it posteriorly. And then you have your widening. So, uh, and trust me, now we're going to do the etmoid. Um, you could enter the etmoid bulla either with a suction or either with a cardo. Uh, try not to enter it with a microdebrider. And then I'm going to let the microdebrider do the job. The etmoid bulla is a ball. We're going to let the macro will really do the dissection going from an interior to posterior. Make sure you see what you're taking out um, to prevent any significant trauma to the orbit or the skull base here. And then systematically removing all of the cells in the partition while trying to preserve as much of the mucosa that's going to remain as possible. And then one mistake I've seen is this ledge here. Many people leave that behind. The orbit as this curve, as it's going into the roof of the maxillary. So you want to make sure this bon bony ledge is removed here. And then now that you have completed the etmoid, you should be able to have complete access to, to a wide maxillary and trust me, the lamina should be exposed. The skull's base should be exposed. And then now we're going to do the sphenoidotomy. The way we, I would typically do it is I would create a line in the superior border of the maxillary sinus or the floor. And the sphenoid is going to, that line is going to bisect the sphenoid sinus area. And then you want to just go below the line in the medial aspect to enter the sphenoid sinus osteum here. And then you would go ahead and enlarge it with a combination of straight shoe cut, um, kerosene one gel, and then uh, microdebrider. And this is what you would get here. Okay, everything is exposed. It's uh, keep the, the field very clean in front of you. Um, and that allow you to really do this case. And uh, when you keep the clean face, the surgery happens very quick and you could do a lot of work in the same day. Just be patient as you're actually going to the process. Um, and um, most of my surgeries are usually that clean. Um, this is not just for this video, but um, typically if you come watch um, what happened in our centers, that's what you're gonna see. And then for the frontal sinus, I know I'm running out of time here. I'll just quickly show this here. Um, Patient with frontal sinus, the way we do it again, we would remove the uncinate, okay? Uncinate process. This is the bulla. We're going to leave the bulla intact in this frontal sinusotomy. Once you pull this, we're going to we uh, remove that again with a curved microdebrider so that we don't traumatize the lateral wall. You use the curved microdebrider to also medialize the middle turbinate away from your from you so that you have better visualization. And then use the frontal sinus probe so that you could really go ahead 
and enlarge the quantum sinus recess. Now there's a specific classification that I've introduced in terms of the extent of quantum sinus disease and how you would do it. Um, again, there's so much that I would like to discuss with you guys here um, that um, I will not be able to show you step-by-step, step, how do you decide what to do in a frontal sinus? Um, if I get invited again, I'll be more than happy to do the extended talks on how you would do things here. Uh, that is not as basic as this one here. And this is moving forward with a big draft 2A two, two, two here uh, for, the, for the frontal sinus. So, in conclusion, the number of endoscopic sinus surgery procedures are increasing. You need a um, multidisciplinary team. You need to make sure you treat those patients for, for allergies. I think balloon sinoplasty is, in, is still in its infancy. Uh, there's some good results there, but I do believe personally that it's being overused and that a lot of those patients that are having balloon sinoplasty should be treated with um, just medical management. Our knowledge of the anatomy is going to be key during sinus surgeries. Do not rely on the uh, image guidance, although it is quite useful. Um, this is a textbook from Dr. Cassiano that I um, co-edited um, that has a lot of the, the, the techniques that I've actually described here. Um, and I do have a, a fellowship if anyone is interested in, interested in contacting me about that. So I will stop here. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak uh, and for the invitation. Um, again, remember there's multiple ways to do things. This is just the way I do it. Um, and I'm sure um, I get good results and um, lots of people get you know great results out there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> that was really good. So uh, I was, I'm laughing because it's that one of the, things about otolaryngology that I think a lot of us like is, is that you, you get to use a lot of technology like endoscopes and you can work in little tiny holes and, and um, you know, you can go basically from floor to Dora and, you know, skull base and sinus is just one of those areas that's, uh, that's very fascinating. I, I don't, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I do have a couple of questions. So one is, you know, um, mixed AR and VR is big, it's in the news again because Apple came out with a new little head lens. But you know, look, our last grand round speaker talked about how AR and, and VR are, are slowly moving into the surgical space. Is there any of that occurring in sinus surgery, in terms of teaching and and um, um, you know, et cetera? No, I mean we haven't done much yet. Not that I know of. I mean, I know that now. What we're trying to do is looking at with chat GPT, how good it is when I, when people are asking a question online about sinus surgery. Um, and uh, it's scary, but it's pretty darn good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, so is there gonna be a place for it in sinus surgery? I think so. And I do believe that it's gonna happen very, very quickly. Um, I don't know what it's gonna be, but yeah. with what people are able to do with it, I expect that in a technology-driven um, subfield as rhinology, it's just a matter of time, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Dr. Taylor has a question in the chat. Can you talk about your post-operative management, topical management? I guess, like, do you use drops or any solutions? Yeah, well, it, it depends on the patient. So um, I actually, one of the reasons why I make very large openings is I believe sinus surgery is just, again, it's just a fancy plumbing job. What you're doing is you're making a cavity to be able to deliver topical medications, okay? So my typical post-operative course is I tell the patients for the first three days, they use um, after nasal spray, sort of like to prevent them from having any bleeding. And right after that, they start doing nasal irrigation. So I let them irrigate for the first um, week or so. And then after I debrief them uh, the first time, and I would start them on something like flunase. If this is a patient who did not have any significant polyps in their nose, um, it was chronic sinusitis without nasal polyp polyposis, flunase is good enough for me. If they had polyps into their nose and I've done polypectomies, 
then I will make sure I put them on budesonide nasal irrigation afterward mm -hmm. because um, that's what's going to give them the, a, a, a problem. I mean, it's so important that if you look at when you do sinus surgery, you open all of them um, and you're irrigating with uh, those cases, the one where the sinus irrigation do not get, the sinus is where it doesn't get in there, like the frontal is the one where you see those little polyps are starting to form. And every time they come, you're actually saying a prayer because that's getting bigger. And you try to put medication, it doesn't get in. So I make them big. And I actually, I'm a big proponent of putting those patients in um, post-operative steroid irrigation as soon as possible, if they, are, they have a lot of inflammation in their nose. Uh, Dr. Powell asks, had you had issues with getting insurance prior offs for your endoscopic septoplasties with your sinus surgery cases? Um, no, not, not necessarily. I mean, you see them here and there, but if you document um, that there's, you know, a significant um, deviation, you are fine. Sometimes they would say something silly as well, what percentage of deviated septum, okay? It's annoying, then you just say, okay, fine. Uh, it's uh, X percentage, and then they would, they, would, they would do it. What I've actually seen more of a problem is doing a sinus procedure with a septum and then you build for both. And then in the postoperative period, when you are doing the treatment, they're telling you it's within the 90 day global period and they don't want to pay for the debridement for the sinus surgery. And then you have to write a letter to explain to them where the debridement is done for the sinus surgery, not for the septoplasty. That's why you add a 79 modifier uh, to point that out that is not related to the septoplasty. And it, it is annoying, and they play the game, but yes, I do see that. But not pre-op, but post-op, which is more of a problem because the post-operative one, as a rhinologist, the debridement is actually more lucrative than actually paying for the septoplasty. Hmm. So, yeah. All right, so uh, last question. Uh, Dr. Taylor said, excellent talk. Do you believe uh, endoscopic sinus surgery for CRS, not fungal, and nasal polyps can be done with cosmetic rhinoplasty? Interesting. Yes. Um, I don't want to um, cause um, women to be mad at me here, but I do um, a significant amount of cosmetic and functional rhinoplasty. Um, and, and yes, I've done that um, because a lot of those patients, they come, you're going to do their surgery, they're going to be under and they ask uh, for it. Um, my story is a little bit different. Um, our department was small. We had two head and neck, one otologist, and then uh, one pediatric person. When I came here, the chair told me, you know what? You're the fifth member. You're going to do trauma, rhinology, laryngology, and facial plastics. <laughs> I started doing this, and for eight years, I was the only one doing um, facial plastics in, with rhinology here. When we had the facial plastics person, I stopped. But yes, I do. I do a fair number of uh, cosmetic and functional rhinoplasties, and I do them with sinus surgery. So yes. All right. Let me just double check. There was one question. Hello. Thank you for a great talk. You made a lot of emphasis on documented patient sense of smell. Do you do this with VAS or do you test smell? Uh, let me see this again. So it's in the Q and A. Oh. Uh, you so how do you document the patient's sense of smell? So VAS, I think of VAS, I think of like um, pain. Yeah. That's something different, obviously. Or do you yeah. do test smell? Yeah, there are test smells that we would do, but those I would reserve not for those patients. Usually, for a patient, the, the overwhelming majority of patients are going to have sinus surgery. You just ask them are they anosmic or not, and I document that. Right? Um, there are patients that are coming specifically because of smell. And that was sort of the same thing before COVID and it got worse after COVID. I think those patients are the patient where you really have to do specific um, uh, uh, exam, a test for them. Um, and uh, typically I, I, I'm not a big fan of anosmia. So I just send them directly to my younger colleague, colleague who just test them appropriately for that. But uh, if it's just patients that you're managing, um, Typically, getting the history is good enough for me and document that uh, um, into into my uh, my chart. So, 
All right, very good, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start to end the talk. Thank you so much. Of course, we will invite you back again. Uh, don't forget to text the for your CME if you're trying to get it. Um, the other thing.